over the last um, 30 or 40 years, well, certainly since the development of nuclear weapons, think tanks have played a very much larger part in the consultation process of government, even if not in the decision-making process. That the gov government has felt it increasingly necessary to reach out to expertise which they do not have in-house. And that, of course, applies to economics and all kinds of other fields as well. Indeed, economic and social studies think tanks were already getting going in the 1930s. Um, Rusi, as a think tank, is probably the oldest of them all, uh, and its influence on government has fluctuated over the years. But certainly I would have thought that for the last 40 or 50 years, think tanks have been a very, very important part of, as I say, the consultation process, if not the decision-making process, of every major Western government. Rusi has played so many different parts and so many roles. Originally, it was simply a discussion group for officers of the army and the navy to get together to gossip, basically. And then, I think, during the later part of the 19th century, for the navy, it was a very, very important venue for the discussion of the impact of new technology. Uh, and where, where um, uh, officers could get together and discuss what was likely to happen. But it tended to be, I think, somewhere where, where retired officers got together to grumble, <laughs> uh, hoping that their, um, their grumbles might, might be heard elsewhere. At times it has been simply a, um, somewhere for the study of Army and Navy history. And certainly when I first knew uh, Rousseau 50 years ago, in the early part of the 1950s. Uh, its only members were retired officers of the armed services, um, mainly all of whom had Second World War uh, experiences, and getting together to discuss the Second World War and be lectured to by off senior officers of the Second World War. And the change began uh, with the development of nuclear weapons and the discussion of nuclear strategy, something which no officer, however senior, however experienced, knew anything more about than people who had never fired a shot in anger. And it was then that, uh, well, the Institute for, for Strategic Studies was founded basically, actually, as, 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 as somewhere to discuss the impact of nuclear weapons on foreign policy. But the armed services, um, also reaching out to academics and scientists and others to discuss the Im Im implications of all that. And it was then, I think, that Rusia started once again becoming influential in government discussions. And ever since then, it has been very close to the armed services because the armed services themselves, I think... The army is the only one which I, I, I know most about, have seen the importance of keeping up with developments and thinking outside their own ranks, possibly abroad, possibly ideas which were then being developed down the road at King's College uh, or, or elsewhere. And civilians started coming in and actually becoming members of the council. Uh, I think I was possibly the first civilian to become a member of the Rusi Council. I wouldn't swear it. Up till that point, it consisted entirely of retired senior officers with all the huge advantages and possible disadvantages which, which that did bring. And then gradually there has been this influx of um, non-uniform people, of specialists, experts and others with a deep interest in military affairs whose advice and experience military leaders have found it worthwhile to draw upon. So I think that you can say that at the moment Rusi is a very influential body indeed and uh, earns its influence by the degree, degree of expertise it does bring in to the discussions. I think the armed forces are probably appreciated by the British public 
to a far greater extent now than they have been at any time since the Second World War, thanks to their performance in Afghanistan, thanks to the um, mobilization of opinion in the press and elsewhere um, uh, to note, celebrate, and mourn the death of every single English soldier, British soldier who's died in Afghanistan. Um, uh, and the realization, actually, of how, much, of, of how much the armed services are doing from us, how much we owe to them. What I don't think is fully, fully appreciated is the degree to which we still live in a very, very dangerous, uncertain, unhappy world in which the use of our armed forces is going to continue to be in demand and may even increase. Uh, and um, I think that if one were really faced, as we are going to be faced very quickly, between an agonizing decision that is going to be taken, are we going to spend as much on the armed forces as they need to maintain a defense policy to which we have uh, pledged ourselves, while at the same time we realize that we cannot continue with the National Health Service without spending a great deal of money on that, that we're going to need to spend a great deal of money on our entire our wealth, welfare system. When it comes to a choice between Britain's position and security in the outside world and the well-being of the British people, that is going to win. The crunch is really going to come. And whether the British people will then say, all right, we'll do with a lesser standard in our hospitals, we'll do with less in the way of welfare benefits, etc., etc., so long as we can maintain the armed forces to enable us to maintain a great power. It will be very interesting to see what decision is then taken. Um, the problem of British foreign policy now, as it has been since the early 1950s, is, as it was well put uh, by Dean Acheson, that we have lost an empire but have not found a role. Uh, and uh, our problem of how we relate to our European neighbors, how we relate, uh, how far our foreign policies can and should be formulated in independence from what our European neighbors are doing, the balance to preserve between our so-called special relationship with the United States, though I prefer essential rather than special, and our, our essential and necessary relationships with our European friends. The relationship with the Commonwealth, alas, is no longer as significant as it has been and as I think it should be. But increasingly, how do we preserve what we regard as being a necessary ro ro world role, something which is, I'm afraid, hardwired into the British political classes, um, on an immensely shrunken budget in face of far greater competition from arising states, uh, China, Brazil, um, India, and Russia is no longer out of the game altogether. How can we go on playing a role? How long can we go on maintaining a right to have a seat in the, in the Security Council, for example, uh, under, under all these changing circumstances? How far is it necessary for us to maintain an, an independent nuclear deterrent? Is this something which is really essential to our survival, or is it there because it gets us a ticket to the top table. These are the problems which the incoming foreign secretaries have faced, every one, I think, probably, since the early, since the early 1950s, and they're going to go on being faced until the early 2050s, too. <laughs>